I'd like to take a look at discovery procedures in the context of generative grammar and contemporary linguistics. It's a topic that's really little understood and very poorly represented in the literature today. And it's not of just historical interest. It really has an impact on how we think about linguistics today. But it means starting with a careful look at, at two things, that, two pieces of writing that actually um, you know, go back more than 65 years. So one of the pieces, uh, one of the books I want to take a look at is Zelik Harris's Methods in Structural Linguistics, which was published in 1951. And the other is, um, well, a pair of books by Noam Chomsky. There's Logical Structure of Linguistic Theory, or LSLT, which Chomsky finished in 1955, and then he, he wrote some, um, uh, uh, he revised it a bit in 1956, and we can take a look at that 1956 version. Um, and then there's the book that Chomsky published in 1957 called Syntactic Structures. So we first need to understand what Zelik Harris was talking about in the context of discovery procedures, although he himself didn't use the term discovery procedures. We need to take a look at that. This has been wildly misrepresented in the literature since. And then we need to look at what Chomsky said about discovery procedures in general and about Zelik Harris's ideas in particular. I think there are a lot of surprises in there. As I say, this is work that's been very, very poorly represented in the, in the literature. So let's go ahead and take a look. We're going to start with um, taking a look at some of the things that Zelik Harris wrote in Methods and Structural Linguistics, his 1951 book that basically got Chomsky interested in linguistics. So it's, it's a very interesting book. Not always easy to read, but it's I'll, I'll do my best to help you. It's a, it's a very interesting book. I'm going to begin by reading some of the material at the beginning of Zelig Harris's Methods in Structural Linguistics. It's really best to hear um, in his own words what Zelig Harris thought he was doing. So let's, let's read some of it. It begins with an introduction which says, This volume represents methods of research used in descriptive, or, or more exactly, structural linguistics. It's thus a discussion of the operations which the linguist may carry out in the course of his investigations, rather than a theory of the structural analyses which result from these investigations. The research methods are arranged here in the form of successive procedures of analysis imposed by the working linguist upon his data. It's hoped that the presentation of the methods in procedural form and order may help reduce the impression of sleight of hand and complexity, which often accompanies the more subtle linguistic analyses. Okay, so the first thing to bear in mind is that there's a distinction between what Harris would write in his analyses. On the one hand, those would be things, articles that he published, for example, in International Journal of American Linguistics or something like that, a professional journal. On the one hand, that's one thing that he would publish. The other is a book like this. And this is to teach somebody how to be a linguist or to teach somebody how it is that Zelig Harris does what he does when he's wearing his hat as a linguist. So it's it's in a sense a textbook. It's explaining to people how things should be done and how he arrives at the conclusions that he does. Okay, he continues. Starting with the utterances which occur uh, in a single language um, community at a single time, these procedures determine what may be regarded as identical in various parts of uh, various utterances and provide a method for identifying all of the utterances as relatively few stated arrangements of relatively few stated elements. Okay, third paragraph. These procedures are not a plan for obtaining data or for field work. You know, that's so important. This is not an explanation of what the linguist should be doing. And it's in no sense a set of methods for somebody setting out to analyze a language. And this, of course, is what people say Harris was trying to do. And he couldn't be clear on the fact, as, I, as he just wrote, that no, that's not what it is. Let's go back to the second sentence of paragraph three. And using them, it does not matter if the linguist obtains the data um, by taking texts, questioning an informant, or recording a conversation, even where the procedures call for particular contact with the informant, as in obtaining repetitions of an utterance. It doesn't matter how this is carried out. For example, the linguist can um, interrupt a conversation to ask the speaker or hearer to repeat an utterance that has occurred um, and may alter the conversation so as to get its recurrence in different environments. Okay. 
Now, the next sentence, of course, is important. That's why I've underlined it. These procedures also do not constitute a necessary laboratory schedule in the sense that each procedure should be completed before the next is entered upon. And Harris is going to explain this again and again. He's ordering the procedures in a particular way for the purpose of writing a book and writing something that can be understood by, by you, by somebody reading the book who doesn't know the contents ahead of time. But the order in which they're presented here does not correspond to a step-by-step -step description of what a linguist does in starting with zero knowledge about a language and ending up with a full grammar. Back to Harris. In practice, linguists take unnumbered shortcuts and intuitive or heuristic guesses and keep many problems about a particular language before them at the same time. They may have figured out the positional variance of several phonies before they decide how to um, cut up into segments certain utterances, which presumably contain a phonetically unusual phoneme. And they will usually know exactly where the boundaries of many morphemes are before they finally determine the phonemes. It's not a problem. The chief usefulness of the procedures listed below is therefore as a reminder in the course of the original research and as a form for checking or presenting the results where it may be desirable to make sure that all the information called for in these procedures has been validly obtained. Okay, so this is not a set of procedures, step-by-step -step procedures. It's a way to think about the justification that you've got and that you'll present to your reader after you've finished the analysis of a language and want to justify your conclusions. Next paragraph, we're now on page two. The methods described here do not eliminate non-uniqueness in linguistic descriptions. It's possible for different linguists working on the same material to set up different phonemic and morphemic elements, to break phonies into simultaneous components or not to do so, to equate two sentences of morphemes as being mutually su substitutable, or not to do so. That's huge. What he's saying is, the way I, Zellig Harris, view linguistic analysis, there isn't necessarily one correct analysis of a language. There can be several, and in particular, the methods here are not developed so as to give a single analysis. Very important. We can argue, obviously, about whether that's the kind of linguistics we want to do, but Harris is ready for that argument. But remember, Harris is not saying that there's going to be a, a, a unique analysis given these methods and given data from a language. The only result of such differences, that is, between different analyses, will be a correlative difference in the final statement as to what the utterances consist of. The use of these procedures is merely to make explicit what choices each linguist makes, so that if two analyses come out with different phoneme lists for a given language, we should have exact statements of what positional variants were assigned by each to what phonemes and wherein lay their difference, differences of assignment. Next paragraph. The methods presented here are consistent but are not the only possible ones of arranging linguistic description. So Harris is taking several steps back. He said that the methods don't give unique analyses. He's also saying this isn't necessarily the only way that I, or for that matter you, need to do linguistics. There are other ways to do things, but he wants to explain in this book what a scientifically justifiable set of procedures would, would look like in some detail. Other methods, back to Harris, other methods can be suggested. For example, one based on relations of selection among segments, whether phonemic or morphemic. As more languages are analyzed, additional refinements and special cases of these or of uh, comparable techniques come to attention. Okay, well, you know, that's perfectly true. That is to say, the more languages linguists look at, the more ideas become available to us as a community, as a discipline, the more analyses become available to us, and then, therefore, the more ways we will think about analyzing a language when we look at it with the crafty analytic eyes of a linguist. The particular way of arranging the facts about a language which is offered here will undoubtedly prove more convenient for some languages than for others. Convenient is an important word for Harris. 
However, it should not have the undesirable effect of forcing all languages to fit a single Procrustean bed and of hiding their differences by imposing on all of them alike, a single set of logical categories. This, of course, um, does not resonate within us. We are completely, um, we are all completely working in a perspective in which the goal is to find a single way that will work well for all languages. And that's not what Harris has in mind here. If such categories were applied, especially to the meanings of forms in various languages, it would be easy to extract parallel results from no matter how divergent forms of speech. A set of suffixes, one or another of which always occurs with every noun, as it say Latin, is, e, e, and a selection of frequently used directional adjectives, say English, of, to, in, can both be called case systems. The procedures given below, however, are merely ways of arranging the original data. And since they go only by formal distinctions, there's no opportunity for uncontrolled interpretation of the data or for forcing of the meaning. For this reason, the data, when arranged according to these procedures, will show different structures for different languages. Further, furthermore, various languages described um, in terms of these procedures can be the more readily compared for structural differences, since any difference between their descriptions will not be due to, a difference, uh, to differences in method used by the linguist, but to differences in how the language data responded to identical um, methods of arrangement. So this is definitely a different worldview, but the goal from Harris's point of view is to come up with grammars that are as different one to another as the languages are against which these, these grammars have been written. There's no sense at all that somehow all of human language reflects a, a single basic language as one occasionally hears people say. Not at all. There's a variety of languages in the world and our methods will be put to the test to see how well they, in a certain sense, identify what the unique or unusual characteristics are that are found in any given language. Let's turn now to look at uh, Chomsky's work in, well, let's take a look at, at syntactic structures first. So this is chapter six, second page of chapter six. Let's read some of what Chomsky writes here. Um, so we'll start with this paragraph. We have not yet considered the following very crucial question. What's the relation between the general theory and the particular grammars that follow from it? In other words, what sense can we give to the notion follow from in this context? Um, it's at this point that our approach will diverge sharply from many theories of linguistic structure. We can read into this, it'll vary, it'll differ from Harris's approach, but yeah, he, he hasn't said this. Okay. So we're going to look now at three models, and these are the three models on uh, item 36 on the next page. Let me read John, what Chomsky says about the first model, which he calls the strongest. The strongest requirement that could be placed on the relation between a theory of linguistic structure and particular grammars is that the theory must provide a practical and mechanical method for actually constructing the grammar given a corpus of utterances. Let's say that such a theory would provide, provide us with a discovery procedure for grammars. Okay. So we see here a black box, think of it as an algorithm or a computer program, and a corpus goes in and out comes a grammar. The natural question to ask then, <clears throat> is this what Harris has in mind? Is he doing, is this the approach he's taking to linguistic theory? <clears throat> and we've seen already, the answer is clearly no. Um, uh, is this what Chomsky thinks Harris is doing? We'll see in a minute uh, when we turn to LSLT that it's, it's not. So this is, an account of discovery procedures. It's not what Harris is trying to do. It's not what Chomsky is trying to do. Let's turn, uh, let's move on to the second paragraph. A weaker requirement, Chomsky writes, would be that the theory must provide a practical and mechanical method for determining whether or not a grammar proposed for a given corpus is in fact the best grammar of the language um, from which this corpus is drawn. Such a theory, which is not concerned with the question of how the grammar is constructed, might be said to provide a decision procedure for the grammars. 
Now, is this what Harris is trying to do? We've already seen the answer is no, because he's happy with the possibility that linguistics could be done in a scientific way and still uh, come up with more than one analysis of a given language. So this is not what Harris is trying to do, although it is true that as he considers um, different possible approaches to analyzing a language, there can be better and worse ways of following a particular analysis. So given a set of assumptions for Harris about how to analyze a language, we can get better and better analyses within that set of assumptions. But there isn't one set of assumptions about how languages should be analyzed, which is, which is simply right, uh, so to speak, without any context. Okay? So this second approach is not what Harris is saying, although he is saying that if you take a specific set of assumptions, you can, you can stepwise or in some particular set of ways, get improved analyses all consistent with that set of assumptions. All right, let's so move on to the third uh, approach to linguistic theory. This is the one that Chomsky himself wants to adopt. An even weaker requirement, he writes, would be that given a corpus and given two proposed grammars, G1 and G2, the theory must tell us which is the better grammar of the language from which the corpus is drawn. In this case, we might say the theory provides an evaluation procedure for grammars. And as I say, this is what Chomsky will, will um, propose for generative grammar, and we'll continue from there. I want to explain the sense in which these three views of linguistic theory are a sort of an obvious allusion to something else. It would have been obvious to anybody who knew something about mathematical logic in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. And it's this. There's an enormous difference between having a statement claiming that it's a true theorem and presenting a proof of that theorem, that's on the one hand, and on the other, having a statement and wanting to know whether it's true or not, that is to say, whether it's a theorem or not, which is to say, wanting to know if we can come up with a theorem, sorry, we can come up with a proof that proves that statement and makes it therefore a theorem. The first is easy, the second is hard. So just to repeat, the first is you're given a statement, we're giving, given a proof of it from axioms that we, we know and understand and accept. Given a proof of it, the only thing we need to be sure of is that the proof is valid and that it does indeed bring us to the conclusion that we're interested in, but that's easy. Checking that a, that a proof is valid is easy not necessarily psychologically easy, but logically it's easy. On the other hand, having a statement and asserting that it's true, which is to say, asserting that, there's a, that there is a proof which brings us to this statement, that's hard. And that's, there's no limit on how hard it can be. It might take centuries to come up with a proof, or you know, the world might end before we even come up with a proof, even though there in some godlike sense there's a proof of it. So the two are not comparable in difficulty. Checking a proof on the one hand, easy. Coming up with a proof, hard. Now today, when we talk about things like this, we actually typically take a, we use a different metaphor if we're teaching something like this. And we usually talk in terms of prime factorization, prime numbers. Um, so given a number that's 200 digits long, we can make a claim that it has um, factors, but um, determining whether that's true or not is typically incredibly hard, unless somebody actually gives us the factorization. If somebody gives us two numbers that have 100 digits in each, and says, well, if you multiply these two numbers together, hey, you're going to get that 200-digit number. Well, it's really easy to check it out. So you take those 200-digit numbers, you multiply them, you get the number we're interested in. You say, hey, fine, it's not prime. These are its factors. On the other hand, if somebody claims that number is not a prime but can't tell you what the factors are, well, you know, that's too bad until we have quantum computers maybe, we're not going to be able to find out whether it's true or not in most cases, whether that number is a prime or not. Okay, that's how we teach things today. But that's not how it was back a bunch of decades ago, where um, 
there was this clear understanding that checking a proof is different from coming up with a proof. Okay, so what does this have to do with syntactic structures and the different conceptions of linguistic theory? Well, it's this. The question is, given a set of data, can we come up with a grammar for it? And we're considering two possibilities. One is the possibility of having it, an algorithm which actually comes up with this incredibly complex object that we call a grammar. And that's hard. On the other hand, there's the question, if I've got a set of data and somebody gives me the grammar, can I check whether that grammar is in a certain sense correct? And what I can do certainly is given a finite corpus, which is what I'm gonna test it against, I can actually just go and see, does this grammar generate all the sentences in the corpus that I've got? That's not hard. So two things, given a set of data, come up with a grammar that generates that data, hard thing. On the other hand, given a set of data and given a proposed grammar for it, is it hard to check whether that grammar generates those sentences? Well, no, it isn't. Okay, well then, given two grammars, what are we going to do? Well, that's, in a sense, the problem. From Harris's point of view, it wasn't a problem because he wasn't limited to a single grammar for a given set of data. From Chomsky's point of view, it's not good enough to say we can have multiple grammars. So we've got to do something. And now this brings us to a much bigger question as to what are we going to do. But I, I hope that I've clarified this question. So there's, there's this real um, close analogy between these two problems, coming up with a theorem and coming up with a grammar. And in a certain sense, I think Chomsky understood that, that the educated reader of syntactic structures would understand this is, this is the, the, the relevant analogy. Okay, now let's continue looking at logical structure of linguistic theory because there Chomsky's a little bit more um, out in the open about what it is that he's ascribing to, to Harris. Unfortunately, I, I think it isn't right what he ascribes to, to Harris, but at least he, he says what he believes. Okay, the risk of a little bit of redundancy, but it's redundancy that we can live with. I'm gonna read um, some of the material on LSLT that corresponds to what Chomsky published in Syntactic Structures a year or two later. He writes, there are several possible ways of construing the relationship between particular grammars and the general theory. Certainly every grammar must be compatible with the theory in the sense that the elements set up in the grammar possess it in a particular way the general properties required by the theory, that is, that the system described by the grammar um, be what is called a true interpretation of the theory. This is the weakest possible requirement. At the other extreme, the strongest requirement would be that the theory provide a practical means for literally, literally constructing the grammar out of uh, the raw data. That is, we might require that the grammar of each language be mechanically derivable from a sufficient corpus once the theory is established. Let's call such a theory procedural. Okay, that's the, the first of the models in syntactic structures two years later. Okay, continue. Thus, given a sufficient corpus, a procedural theory will lead us directly to a grammatical description of the language in some practical way, requiring, in principle, no ingenuity or, um, or um, ingenuity or intuition on the part of the linguist. I here let me just add no intuition or ingenuity at this point. Of course, the ingenuity and the intuition went into developing the algorithm in the first place. A procedural theory gives what might be called a practical procedure for grammars. A weaker requirement than this would be that given a grammar, the theory must provide a practical mechanical way of validating it, that is, of showing that it is in fact the best grammar of the language in a sense specified by the theory. So that's the second approach in syntactic structures as you'll write it a year or two later. The second approach is hugely different from the first. So the second approach means, what do we do? Can we imagine a linguistic theory that evaluates a grammar that somebody else came up with, given a set of data and that grammar, can we evaluate? It's like given a proof, given a proof and a, and a candidate theorem, can we tell whether the proof is in fact valid? That's easy. The previous step, the previous challenge, which was, 
given data, come up with a grammar for it. That's hard. And now this idea that Chomsky is, is just conflating them and calling them both procedural, it boggles the mind because it just re rejects everything that the metaphor was trying to show. And, and so there's something really wrong here, rhetorically wrong. You don't want to call those two things by the same name. You want to make it really clear how different they are. And so Chomsky goes on, as we'll see in a second, and he says, well, it's the second thing that Harris seems to be trying to do. Well, yeah, maybe he is, maybe he isn't. He isn't, but it's not that far from what he's trying to do. But it's very different from the first, and it's that first thing, which is what linguists have remembered as the claim that Zelig Harris was out to do that. That is to say, that he was out to create an algorithm which would, from data, generate grammars. Now, let me say, there are a lot of people today trying to do exactly that. It's not crazy. I'm one of the people. But this, this is not what Harris was trying to do. I'd like to compare <clears throat> the 1955-56 version of LSLT with the version that was published in 1975 with respect to exactly this passage that we're covering. Because there's a, there's a discrepancy, and from the point of view of what I'm focusing on here right now, it's a big discrepancy. Um, so let's take a look. Um, as we, we just looked at that material, we saw that Chomsky used the term procedural theory to describe a conception of linguistics in which you construct an algorithm, a black box, um, where you put data in and out comes a grammar. Nobody's proposing to do that back in the 40s and 50s, but that's what Chomsky's setting up is his notion of procedural theory. Now, we take a Chomsky takes a step back to consider a weaker position, and he writes, you see on the left here, a weaker requirement than this would be that, a, that given a grammar, the theory must provide a practical mechanical way of validating it, that is, of showing that it is in fact the best grammar of the language, in a sense specified by the theory. Okay, So that's a view in which you don't have to come up with an algorithm that creates the grammar, you just have to check it, basically, to see if there's a uh, uh, an algorithmic approach that'll say yes or no, this is the, well, either best or, or correct grammar of the language. Um, now Chomsky is something that I think is really wrong. And it's playing with the terminology here uh, in a way that we really have to resist. Okay, the next sentence is extending the sense of procedural theory to cover this case. That's the problem, okay? That's the problem. Extending the sense of procedural theory to cover this case, we can say that a procedural theory provides a practical decision procedure for the notion grammar of a language. That's really wrong because we have to keep very clear the distinction between thinking that we're going to have a method that automatically comes up with a grammar versus a method which given data and a grammar gives some kind of judgment about how good that grammar is. That's the distinction that's playing such a big role in the world of mathematical logic. It's the difference between um, deciding that a proof is valid and somebody gives you the proof on the one hand and given, um, given a hypothesis, is it a, is it a theorem? That is, is there a proof that'll prove it? Well, that's very, very hard. Okay. And it's this distinction which Chomsky starts out by separate, by using such a distinction. And now, terminologically, he's putting them together, which we shouldn't do. All right. Then the next sentence is, this would seem to be the proper interpretation for the kind of theory that Harris is interested in building in his methods in structural linguistics. Well, so what do we learn? So Chomsky is saying that it's this second approach which he believes uh, Harris is trying to do. But now he's free to say that this is a procedural theory and conceptually we've, we've eliminated the distinction between whether you think you can create a, a grammar given a set of data automatically 
or not. And that's a huge difference. All right. Um, so is this a proper interpretation of what Harris uh, does or what he's proposing that linguistics should do in the 50s? No. First of all, Harris is perfectly happy with multiple analyses. There isn't one best one. And second of all, when he takes a set of assumptions about how to, what a grammar ought to look like, he continually makes the grammar better and better. He considers various hypotheses about how to, how to manipulate it, how to make it better, cleaner, sharper, more insightful. And so at the end of the day, there's never a moment at which uh, Harris is willing to say, and the grammar can't be made any better. Well, that's exactly the conception of how to do linguistic theory that Chomsky's going to put in the next stepping back, where we compare different grammars. So here we, this is really an important step here. If we're going to understand the sense in which Chomsky really misrepresents what Harris is trying to do. That middle category of conceptions of linguistic theory in which it's said that the linguistic theory will say yes or no, this is the best grammar. Harris rejects that for two reasons. First of all, because there can be many correct grammars for a, a given set of data. And second of all, within a particular set of assumptions, there's no point at which you want to say, I'm certain there's no way to improve this grammar. This is important. Then in the, the published version, the 1975 version of LSLT, um, shows these two sentences have evolved into the following sentence. Such a theory um, provides a practical decision procedure for the notion grammar of a language. So um, what we've turned from discovery procedure to decision procedure. That's the important distinction, and that's right. It's right to keep the two different, but we've lost the reference to Harris and the reasons that I gave before f to indicate why this second approach does not describe what Harris was in fact interested in. There's no response to that. There's just the allusion to Zelig Harris, which disappears in the published version. And then after that, the, the, the two um, editions, the 56 and the 75, um, are parallel. Let's draw this discussion to a close then. What I've tried to um, show you is the way in which Chomsky's ideas um, compared to Harris's and the important ways in which Chomsky basically misrepresented the, the central approach that Harris was trying to take uh, in his work in the 1940s and the work that was put together in his Methods and Structural Linguistics. So why is this important? Well, it's important for me, for two reasons. One is I'm really interested in how knowledge evolves, and that interest has come out in a book I published last year with Bernard Lacht called Battle in the Minefields. The material that I've talked about uh, just now is uh, material that's going to go in a, a follow-up book um, that we're in the process of writing. At the same time, um, this material is important because the question of discovery procedures has come back. And in the context of machine learning, which is a, a field essentially of computer science that, um, that came into its own in the mid-1980s. So the journal called Machine Learning, for example, uh, was set up in 1985. And over the last 30 years, um, machine learning has had an enormous impact on a large number of, of fields. And there are a lot of linguists, some computational linguists, some theoretical linguists, whose work has been uh, greatly influenced by machine learning, and I'm one of them. Um, and if we're going to understand the relationship of machine learning to general linguistic theory, we have to go back and, and look at the history of our discipline and see how um, our conception of ourselves as, as a discipline has been influenced by um, how we view linguistic analysis and how it would relate to, to machine learning. I've been struck a couple times by um, colleagues uh, in linguistics who um, have looked at, uh, at work, some of it in linguistics, some of it in machine learning, 
and have said, oh, that's just a matter of decision of uh, discovery procedures. And what I, I think is important for you to realize is that um, in Chomsky's discussion, and here it seems to me there's no question that he's right, if we could provide a linguistic theory that in fact had discovery procedures that worked, we'd be in great shape. That's the highest bar. That's exactly what we want. And I, I've just been struck by uh, reading people who, who write about um, pre-generative linguistics and they say, well, they only had discovery procedures. That was all that they were trying to do without, without understanding that th that's huge. If you've got a discovery procedure, that's great. And that, that's surely what we want to have. Okay, so putting it all together, this is what you need to know about Zelig Harris's work in the, in the 40s. Uh, and how Chomsky's conception of generative grammar grew out of that and how, how Chomsky conceived of his, uh, his approach and how it related to generative grammar and what you need to know about um, discovery procedures.